So can everybody hear me as a sort of starter? Can you hear me OK? Great. OK. Um, so let me start by just um, thanking Alan and thanking Matt, who's sitting up in the gods at the back, for that very nice, warm introduction, uh, both today and yesterday. Uh, ben and I are absolutely thrilled to be here. And I'm particularly thrilled that Matt and Alan would move into this exciting area of thinking about how the computational foundry can be involved in citizen science and vice versa. And I think as Matt said this morning, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for people who are coming more perhaps from the computational side as well as from the science side because increasingly over a number of years, although scientists have been using uh, very elaborate uh, sensing systems, more recently drones, and a lot of other things, um, much citizen science is, of course, also done with these devices. But we're moving forward into an area where I think there is tremendous opportunity for people who are involved in HCI and computer science to find really interesting problems that relate to citizen science and vice versa. So very much what today is going to be about is on how we might collaborate uh, on those two kinds of areas. So um, one of the things that I wanted to say is echoing again what Matt and um, Alan said, this is very much a day of action. We've got some amazing speakers. I'm very thrilled to have the range of speakers and I will introduce each of them in turn, but we have a really terrific lineup of speakers, some of whom do citizen science very much in a primarily face-to-face, -face, out on the estuary, out on the, the beaches and things. And Jeff Prophet, who's a Swansea academic, is going to start us off by telling us about the kinds of things that happen in Swansea. And I know from a previous visit that that involves quite a number of different projects. And then we move to Julia Parrish, who's come all the way from uh, Washington, that's Washington State, from the University of Washington, Seattle, to tell us about a project that she's been running, um, glamorously about dead birds, but you, you would be amazed what you will learn about science, migrations, weather, oceans, and all sorts of other things by studying dead birds. Julia's project has been running for 19 years, which I find phenomenal. And then we move to Helen Spears from Zooniverse. And Zooniverse is, as you probably know, a very large online platform with a large number of projects there where people um, develop their own sites, place their own data there, and do their own scientific investigations of that data. And what Helen has been doing is looking at how people are using that data. So that's a contrast from the more face-to-face, -face, a place-based, out in the rain and out in the sunshine kind of approach. And then uh, in the afternoon, we move to talk about um, citizen science in some different contexts, particularly uh, over overseas, Muki Hackley who is from UCL, has been doing extreme citizen science. I'll let Muki explain what that means for you. And Muki is trained uh, both as a geographer, uh, specializing in uh, visualization, and also as a computer scientist. And then finally, we have a very interesting presentation from Eileen Scanlon, who is sitting in the guards at the back there. And Eileen has, for many years, been involved in, way before many of us, uh, not the biologists and the scientists, but people like me who come from the interaction design side, really thought about uh, citizen science in any kind of deep way. Eileen has been engaging the public and studying public participation uh, in science um, through an educational sort of perspective, but she's also a physicist and a scientist herself. So Eileen is going to round off the day for us. Uh, before 
we have some discussion and before we put our better shoes on and go running off with Jeff across the sand dunes to see, uh, and I can't pronounce this, but Cymru Burrows, is that kind of right? Crumlin. Crumlin Burrows, um, which is a site of special scientific interest, which means that it's a specially preserved site um, where scientists go to work and it's also preserved for the public to go there and people can't build on it and it's carefully protected. So I think that's going to be a fantastic addition to the day. Um, so that's the, the basic sort of layout of the day. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself first before about how I ended up uh, working in citizen science because um, as Alan said, I am actually have been for many years working in interaction design. I'm not a computer scientist by background. I'm an information scientist and education tech person, but have learned some computing along the way. But before I do that, I'd be very interested to know this, a bit about the backgrounds of all of you, and I think our speakers would too. So if you would be so kind as to put up a show of hands, how many people uh, consider themselves to be basically computer scientists? or involved in computing in some way. That's about a quarter, I'm guessing. How many of you consider yourself to be scientists in some way or other? You might be both. You could easily be both. A few more of you. A few more of you, so a little, little, uh, few more. How many of you have got involved in a citizen science project in any way, either through research or through collecting data? All of, our all of our speakers, come on, hands up, all of our speakers. Yeah, and a few, a few others. So about a quarter of the audience. Uh, am I missing, I'm sure I'm missing, how, who's from business or engineering or? Yeah. School of management and business. School of management. School of management. Psychology. Psychology, oh yes, probably quite a few people from psychology. <laughs> So great, so we've got a wonderful mix of audience. And actually in our speakers, I described briefly, uh, really uh, a very representative of the breakdown of the audience. So before I do that, the aim of this, and I just want to emphasize again, is for lots of interaction. And we've called it uh, new agendas and broader impact. New agendas could relate to research, it could relate to practice, it could relate to people managing local projects, it could relate to all kinds of things. So we're taking a very broad definition. And of course, broader impacts, we want to have impact both locally in this area of Swansea. I think that would please Matt and Alan, um, so we want to do that. Um, and we also want to have impact more broadly within the UK and some of us have been talking about what might come out of today with all your wonderful audience um, questions and our terrific speakers. And we're thinking that the minimal of that would be uh, some sort of report. And Liz, who's sitting in the middle there, and uh, Janice, who's sitting at the end, edge here, have very generously offered to take some notes during the day. Liz has offered for the whole day. Janice has offered for the afternoon, and if anybody else would like to as well, Moki is always taking notes. <laughs> so um, at the end of the day, we will have a set of notes of new agendas and broader impacts. And then we'll have a little discussion in the final session. This could be um, a, a little paper that we might submit to a new journal called Citizen Science Theory and Practice could be on the practice side, as well as making it available to Matt and Jeff and Alan and all the people from Swansea as they think about how computing and um, citizen science and science might come together. So we could have all of us authoring this paper. It'd be a bit unusual, but we could do it and um, might guarantee that it gets accepted and out to the broader world. So that might be um, a good impact. And talking of the broader world, um, Julia, I want to thank 
Julia, I don't think she's here, um, for her organization as well. But Julia reminded me to tell you, talking about the broader world, is that you can um, twi tweet using hashtag Foundry Fest. And there's quite a lot of tweeting yesterday. And there will be uh, probably quite a lot of tweeting today. We have a person who I regard as tweeter supreme sitting in the front here. I get most of my tweet knowledge about citizen science from Mookie's tweets. So I know there's going to be some tweets. So that's the sort of broad outline for the day and the basic goals, that we should have something that talks about new agendas and broader impact that people from computing, people from uh, science, people who are involved in citizen science and management and all those other areas can get involved in. And the computational foundry can use it to some extent as some blueprints, maybe for projects, um, and the rest of us can, can also benefit from it. So my name is Jennifer Priest. I'm from the University of Maryland. And as Alan said, I've been involved in human-computer interaction for a number of years now. Um, and so you might think, well, how did I get involved in citizen science? And there's two answers to that. One of them is that I've always been passionate about in the environment. And I'm not a very good birder, but I love to go and see birds. And I love to see the flowers. And I love to see the natural environment. It's what I do in my hobby time. And uh, that, that's how I spend a lot of time. And so when the National Science Foundation, which is kind of equivalent to the British USPC, you are P e e -R -P -C. E -R -P -C. Thank you. Put out a call in about 2008, 2010 for social computing, I went, aha, that could be a citizen science project. So that really launched my first um, funded citizen science project. Um, of course, Julia and many, many others have been involved as biologists uh, and scientists in citizen science for many years. And indeed, when we go back, citizen science has, for scientists, um, it's been around for a very long time. So that was my first sort of involvement with it. Um, and what I would like to do is just give a few very broad definitions, tell you a tiny bit about my work, and then hand over to the other speakers that we've brought in who've got amazing stories to tell. So citizen science was in about 2009, as far as I was concerned, as a information scientist, um, interaction design person came, coming into it, not from the scientist point of view, what was defined more or less in parallel by Rick Bonney from Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Jonathan Silverton, who at that time was at the Open University, is now at Edinburgh. And the, it was defined as a partnership between scientists and volunteers to collect and analyze data. Since that time, I think the definition has shifted hugely to involve citizens much, much more in the, the whole scientific project. So now we think of citizen science as being involving participants right from the kind of conception of what the scientific problem is that they want to solve, right through to the collecting the data, the analyzing the data, the reporting the data, and communicating the data more broadly. So we have a much broader definition. And that definition, for those who are interested, is, is available from a paper from Jennifer Shirk and Rick Bonney. Probably others have written this too in 2015. That gives a nice broader definition. Now that's important because that's a way of involving our participants much more deeply in the, the kind of enterprise of the science. So I was out on the beach yesterday with Julia and Ben and there's a group of people out there and they're obviously doing things. They're constructing or putting a fence up and you can see there's a group of people, somebody who's organizing it, and you can see at the edge here, there's a bank with grass on. I don't know if it's marum or spartina. Marum, I'm getting a nod. Um, so it's marum grass. And the intention is to you know, build out more from here to a protection, at least 
We assume that's the intention. But the important thing is that it's a group of people, and they're out there, and they're doing something active. And that was just yesterday. And you can walk out tomorrow, or you can walk out this evening and see what progress they have made. So my work, um, I work with a, a group of, of people. And there's a most recent paper was 2019. It's involved with interaction design of what we call community-driven environmental projects. So these are citizen science projects. Uh, it's funded by the National Science Foundation four-year project. And we were primarily interested in how do you design the technology using mostly these cell phones, um, websites, e uh, easily available technologies for doing small local projects. And I'm going to give you some examples of some bigger projects afterwards. But these are small, very locally place-based projects um, along the Anacostia River, uh, which runs on the eastern side of uh, Maryland and um, Washington, DC. And it's a very heavily polluted river. And people tend to be very involved in their own little area of that river. So assuming I can get the video to work OK, uh, I'm going to let the video speak for me. This project is central to our understanding. What happens when we start paying closer attention to plants and animals, waterways, parks, and backyards? Researchers at the University of Maryland, the University of North Carolina Charlotte, and the University of Colorado are working with community <coughs> partners at two local nature centers, the Anacostia Watershed Society and the Reedy Creek Nature Center, to develop technology to support a deeper understanding of and more engagement with local environments. The tool we are developing is called NatureNet. It helps communities carry out projects in their own local environment. In Maryland and the District of Columbia, volunteer watershed stewards learn about improving the health of the Anacostia River by creating projects to manage stormwater runoff. NatureNet helps them map, capture, and share information about their projects with each other and the public. At Reedy Creek Nature Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, Naturalists develop projects that will help park visitors to use their mobile phones to collect data to understand more about nature in the park. Visitors can come in from the trails to see their observations and those from other visitors on a large interactive screen at the kiosk. We are now studying the impact of NatureNet on people's knowledge of local environmental issues and actions. Their understanding of science in their everyday lives, their sense of connection with nature, and their scientific, computational, and technology skills. Are you interested in joining forces with others in your community to better understand and protect local places? Then NatureNet may be the tool you need. What is NatureNet? NatureNet is designed to evolve in response to users who recommend new projects and technology improvements through the Design Ideas feature. We think this is a first crowdsourcing to guide the evolution of a location-based citizen science platform. And now, we're encouraging its adoption and adaptation in many other outdoor settings, from parks, environmental stewardship programs, to your own backyard. Here's how you can get started. Participants in NatureNet can also influence the design of technology that they use by offering design ideas, which they can input via the app or website. <coughs> Interested in learning more about the impact of NatureNet? You can read more on our website, download the apps, or check out our research website, research.nature-net.org, where you can track the use of our system through real-time visualizations and follow our project on social media. We hope that NatureNet will expand and support data collection and communication around environmental issues that matter to you and your neighborhood. Help make a difference in your local environment. Contribute your nature observations to NatureNet today. Now that was a project that we're just finishing and one of the important words in there is crowdsourcing because of course citizen science involves crowdsourcing both by people and also using technology. 
Now, I can almost feel some of the computer scientists in the room saying, well, you know, it's, that's kind of fine. I can understand how that's really interesting maybe to people who are interested in participation and getting people involved in citizen science and do, doing local advocacy. But it's just using, you know, the web and cell phones. And there isn't anything that maybe stands out as being innovative in the computing sense. You're not using drones, you're not using state-of-the-art technology, you're not using machine learning, um, you're not talking about AI as we talked all yesterday. But when we put that proposal through, the idea of actually crowdsourcing the design was basically why, I think, why it got funded. So this was an interaction design project and we were interested in participation and all of these different things and we desperately wanted our users to use the technology but from the National Science Foundation's point of view what they were really interested in is how can you crowdsource design. And I want to use that example a little bit because I think it points out and maybe uh, points out some of the things that are interesting for both citizen science people, scientists, and computer scientists. And that is when we first started doing this, um, we were interested in getting people to send in their design ideas. They would use their technology to go out and collect photographs, upload them into a special area, um, and they would provide design ideas of the, either the things they liked or things to often to correct the usability. Um, and this was after fairly intensive, what we call in HCI, participatory design practice, where you work with your users to design your system. But guess what? Very few design ideas came forward. Any ideas why? Anybody want to suggest why we had tremendous problem getting design ideas from our community? Come on, give us some suggestions. Any, nothing's wrong, anything's good. Exactly, exactly. Liz is a specialist in communication, I discovered. <laughs> well, it turns out that what the design team had talked to a few groups of users about and what we were talking about design ideas was like, what on earth is a design idea? What kind of thing should I put forward? I, and I don't know if I put forward this idea if it's going to be sensible. Will other people laugh at my idea? Will it be a stupid idea? How will we deal with that? So we spent a lot of time trying to help our small communities. And these were very small projects. They went through um, training in watershed stewardship, and then they did a capstone project. Of uh, they, they had a year to do it in, and they had to work with another group of often very small, three to five to eight, to 10 would be a big project in their local area. So they were small compared with, I think, all the other citizen science projects that you're gonna hear about in the rest of the day. So that also was an issue. And our goal was to understand how we could develop maybe a preliminary sort of map of what it means, what are the characteristics of these small projects that others could then build on to support that kind of local action. The other thing that happened was that in our participatory design uh, experience, we didn't really realize we were doing this, but we were all sort of thinking of communities of practice. Now, the emphasis there is on the word practice. And what we realized after talking to people and also reading more of the theory, and yes, theory is useful in these projects that seem very pragmatic, was that actually what people were most interested in, they didn't think of themselves as doing practice. What they thought of themselves as doing was working with others and communicating. And so we were lucky that a colleague that was on the video, Tammy Clegg, is based in education. And she said, well, what about G's work, which is very much about sort of semiotic communication and affinity, affinity networks of people, affinity networks of ideas. And what that suggested to us was that we needed software that was much more open, less sort of structured as it would be for practice, if the practice is primarily, you know, to submit um, photographs, submit uh, comments, help other people to do their designs. What so what we really needed to do was open it out and focus much more on the communication and the sort of affinity. 
uh, of people's ideas and of working together. The other thing we discovered was just the importance of local leadership and how local leadership can really change as a project develops and needs to be fluent. You know, you have some people who can put up spreadsheets, you have other people who know about design, who are good with technology, um, and it changes. And so we had a few wonderful stories. One involved a person who, I'm not using his correct name, called Tim the Plumber. And Tim the Plumber was really quite a character. Tim worked in a local community center. He brought in a few hundred plumbers each year for about five years and they worked partly and they trained. And Tim was phenomenally insightful because he realized that in this area of Maryland, this poorer area of Maryland, that there seemed to be more really heavy rainfall. And when that heavy rainfall happened, all the junk from the street, including McDonald's, you know, cartons and Burger King cartons, and as well as, you know, nitrates and the salt put down, it was all going into the river. So he reconceptualized what training for, for plumbing involved. And one of the things that he did was he, he got his plumbing cadets, plumbing students, involved in citizen science. So that led to a few interesting weekends where the whole team went out and got involved in handing out rain barrels, not just handing them out, but also learning and being able to demonstrate how you link up your rain barrel and how you cut pipe and all of those sorts of things. So we realized the importance of local leadership and also the importance of allowing people to sort of shift their skills and recognize each other's skills. Another example was with my colleague there who, um, gets very involved in, the, in a church where there's a large number of African Americans. They know her, they trust her, and they, they did various education projects with her. So those were some of the things that we learned from our experience in, in that project. And as I say, if you're interested in reading more, I can give you the paper. But I just want to move on very quickly before our other speakers start, just to give you a tiny bit of background, because that's a very small project, and it ran just over four years. One, a project that you may know about is this one from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's one of the most famous, apart from the ones in our speakers, of course. Um, and it's been running from about 2002. And for those of you in the computer science side, as well as the uh, citizen science side, you will find amazing data visualizations there, where you can look at, the, you can look at bird migrations, particular species over a year, over several years. You can look at you know, diagrams of um, contributions. There is a huge amount of very interesting computer science in that. And there's also machine vision, uh, which has been added recently. So if you can get a picture of a bird, even though it may be occluded with leaves and, and um, branches, um, you stand a good chance of getting some help in the um, identification of that bird. And just look at the scale of this, over 370 million bird sightings. And this is data from 2017. It's quite hard to get hold of their exact data. But 370 million bird sightings of over 10,000 species from over 200,000 users. And some of our other projects are going to be similar to that. So there are some very big scale stuff. Loads of opportunity for people doing visualization as well as people interested in participation and data quality. So that's another one for you to take a look at. iNaturalist is another one that I like, and I'm choosing ones that I know the speakers are not mentioning today. There's iSpot and iSpot Nature and Zooniverse. You'll hear more about those later. Um, but this is uh, updated data, although my page is not updated. But look at the scale of this. It's a social network and community site. There's over 20,000 observations per day, was what they recorded. On one day, there was a bio blitz where a whole group of people went out to collect data together. 124,000, you know, pieces of data. I find that phenomenal. 20 million observations of 210,000 species. 1.4 million users across the whole world, many places that you maybe might not imagine that you've got birders, 
um, and they're aiming for 50 million observations by 2020. Not sure exactly how they're getting on, but it's, it's pretty phenomenal. And there are hundreds and thousands of different citizen science projects. So if I'm mentioning stuff that you think, well, I'm not a birder, I'm a plant person, there's lots for you. There is, um, you can look up SciStarter. There are over a thousand different projects on SciStarter that if you want to, you can get involved in, in a very wide range of things. I'm talking mostly about biodiversity, but I mean, there are things on medical, there are things uh, to do with citizen uh, uh, conservation, there are things to do with climate change, plants, the weather, all kinds of different things, huge range. And for those who are, would like to also get involved in a, it's not clicking. Ah, there, whoops, sorry, sorry about that. Um, there is also wildlabs.net. And if you can read this, I'll just read it to you. Wildlabs.net is a community of conservationist technologists engineers, data scientists, entrepreneurs, and change makers. That sounds like it's talking to you, this audience. Um, together we share information, ideas, tools, and resources to discover and implement technology-enabled solutions to some of the biggest conservation challenges facing our planet. And we've got some pretty big ones coming in terms of climate change and habitat loss. So major issues, I think, for citizen science, and these are two that are very well known, um, for scientists getting enough data and getting trusted data, and I suspect some of our other sp speakers are going to talk, talk about how data is, can be checked to make sure it's trustworthy. Um, I was kind of both heartened and a little bit um, shocked at this. A few people have the ability to contribute. The vast majority simply act as potential locations for sensor development. This author was, act, that actually was said to, to this author in 2017, it was reported from a, a large European project. For citizens, learning and contributing. We've done quite a lot of work on this and many people get involved in citizen science because they're engaged and they want to learn and there's something that they feel passionate about. But they then want to move through and become real partners and to become um, you know, a partner in this scientific endeavor. And this is a paper that one of my ex-students wrote. And we could also think, what are the major issues for computer science? And just from talking to Alan and Matt at various times, a major issue for a computer scientist being involved is, is there something that's really interesting in computer science from the research point of view that we can actually make a contribution to that's not just programming an app or not just programming the web, but is actually really creative? Um, and this could involve, yesterday we talked a lot about ethics and privacy. There are big privacy issues, particularly for place-based citizen science, but also for your online data and many more. So there's a, there's a lot that computer scientists can, with uh, scientists and citizen scientists, contribute to. So some of the things that we might think about during the day, some very broad categories are people. How do we diversify and involve more people? And this has been a big issue for NSF and for everybody in citizen science. Data quality, I've already talked about, and I'm not going to elaborate on these because you guys are going to fill in some of the details as you hear from the speakers and you make notes about them. But some broad categories might be people, data quality, project management, that maybe the business groups would get involved in that. Technology and tools is an obvious one for computer science. Values and ethics, a lot of discussion yesterday about this. And driving through, you know, what we find out in terms of values and ethics into policies that have some real bite in uh, different countries and parts of the world. So two of my personal broader impacts that I would personally love to see is to leverage the skills of HCI, uh, taking that broadly, computer science in general, and citizen science specialists to advance both fields, to be something that is really great for both. 
and to help to use our skills to mitigate the effects of climate change and habitat loss. There's a huge amount, and I think many, uh, many of us now are really convinced by the science of climate change, the fact that we are told we're in the fifth or sixth, is it sixth extinction period where there's huge habitat loss. So there's really a lot that we can do.